Um, my name is Jeremy McCullough. If you saw me yesterday, I was doing the uh, cloud talk. Uh, this is going to be a real talk on uh, data aggregation with MongoDB. And uh, so the topics I want to go through today are going to be the state of aggregation, like how we're aggregating data now, and then the assumption here is that you have some data in MongoDB. Uh, so I'm going to go through the alternatives that people are using and then introduce um, a framework uh, that was published uh, with Mongo 2.2 last year um, and is still, I guess, being adopted. Uh, we're going to go through the uh, pipeline expressions of the two parts of it. Uh, just a little feedback if you want to turn it down. Uh, and then look at how to use it. I'm going to go through two demos. Uh, one is going to be using uh, MapReduce uh, to do real-time data aggregation. Uh, and then going to be using the aggregation framework in a demo towards the end. Uh, and uh, lastly, we'll just take a look at the, some of the features down the line. Uh, and then should have plenty of time for questions. It's usually a 40-minute talk. Uh, so the current state, uh, the assumptions I'm going to make uh, for the audience is that there's some data in Mongo or you're considering putting some data in Mongo uh, and you'd like to run real-time querying on it. Uh, but since it's not a SQL database, you don't have the full facilities available. Uh, to do, th like, group buys and join queries, things like that. Um, so what are the, the current things that we're using uh, to get around this? I think a lot of, uh, definitely a lot of, like, larger customers of TenGen uh, use data warehousing techniques. This is basically taking your data uh, that's in a um, non-relational database and putting it into a separate system, whether it's, um, Chris, if you want to remind me here, what is OpenSky using that Rex was working on? Was that? MySQL, and then there was some Microsoft, like, Viewpoint, or sure, not anymore? Okay. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people are taking their data and then using these extract transform load processes to put it into a SQL database so they can run their familiar queries or use these existing, like, suite. There's tons of tools already to query those SQL databases. So it's this process of maintaining something to put our data into some place where we could work with it easier. Um, to it, this is, uh, we end up working with, like, is this no longer real time because maybe we're doing this once, once at night. Uh, we're duplicating our data, and there's these other processes that we have to maintain, so our technology stack just got a lot more complicated. Um, but this is, I think, probably the most widely used, um, especially with larger companies, uh, because they have their um, processes already in place. Uh, so if they're gonna use a new data system, they need to have um, the existing uh, place to query it. Uh, the other thing I wanna look at is, uh, and this is gonna have I'm going to do a little segue into John Noonmaker's presentation here. Uh, but schema-based aggregation is basically where we're going to store the data in some pre-aggregated fashion. Um, and so in Mongo's case, we're just going to have our documents. Uh, and for anyone not familiar with, like, the document storage model, it's basically JSON documents. And those are going into our database. And they have an ID column that we can identify our documents by. And then beyond that, it's just free-form data. So we could have arrays and embedded objects and things like that. So in schema-based aggregation, we have these documents and they're storing, say, like running counts, running averages. And as we're inserting data, we're updating the aggregated values. Um, and so this makes our insertions and updates a little more complicated. Uh, but down when we're querying it, we, if this works great for things like analytics and statistics, we can do really quick reads and maybe we'll have a document for all the web hits for a month or for a day. Uh, and then individual fields counted by hour and minute and things like that. Um, and when you're working, when you're doing this kind of aggregate, or when you're doing this kind of um, schema in Mongo, the, th the main thing that you want to take away is try to do in-place updates so that your document size doesn't change over the course of, say, the month that you're collecting statistics. And this is going to avoid fragmentation when we have to, when your document is freeform, it's not like a SQL row where it's maybe 65K and then your rows are, are not really growing beyond that. Uh, but when you have a document where your, your documents can be anywhere from a few K up to megabytes, uh, as they're growing, they have to get relocated on disk. So just like a file system, that could lead to fragmentation. Um, so the segue into John's presentation uh, that I just want to show here is their schema from, uh, he currently works for GitHub, and this was, uh, he presented this at a 10-gen conference last year. Uh, and this is their application gauges, which does web stats. So it's like somehow convince people to pay for this instead of use Google Analytics, uh, which is all the better because it was a great presentation. Uh, so they basically have web stats for um, things like screen resolutions, visits, uniques, uh, per month or per day. And their schema basically looks like this. And I know some of you that are, I've seen some customers Mongo schemas, a lot of people use short field names. You know, OpenSky does this. Uh, 
And in this case, he basically has, um, for this given year, month, down to the uh, hour, is basically tallying the two different uh, T and U values here, whatever those might be. And at the top level, we have those aggregate values for the entire year. And then when he's doing those updates, he's just updating the individual uh, fields, uh, basically like that. So updating the uh, down to the hour, uh, sorry, down to the day, and then updating the top levels as well, incrementing those. Uh, and so this is the example of now our inserts and updates were counting and incrementing a few different fields, but when we're querying, we're going to have the data exactly how we need it. So our reads are going to be a lot quicker. Uh, and the takeaway to do in place um, uh, updates here is basically create the whole frame of your document on that first day of the month. So the first day of the month, he's going to have for each day have a a blank uh, integer field there already set and allocated uh, for whatever that's eight bytes per integer or something like that. And so as he's incrementing them, the document itself is never growing. So all the fields already exist. Uh, so this is a great example. Let me try and get to the next slide. Okay. Uh, so that's great for, again, for like analytics and simple like counting and averages, uh, but things can get certainly more complex. This is where MapReduce comes in, and this is used certainly not even just related to Mongo. Um, but things like Cassandra and um, much other, other large data stores. So just, the takeaway here is going to be a very versatile and powerful tool, and wrapping your head around it the first time is going to be a struggle. Um, I certainly, it took me quite a while to uh, just to pick up and write a proper map and a reduce routine. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, mistakes along the way. Uh, but it's basically intended for large-scale data analysis, and there's no, uh, typically, if you're working with something like Hadoop, your map and your reduce routines are, are Java applications. And in Mongo's case, there's a facility to use JavaScript. So you have a full programming language that you're, you're not limited to these aggregation operators or anything like that. Uh, but when we're doing these simple tasks like grouping and averaging, it's, it can be really overkill for that. Uh, still, there's uh, the demo where there is an appropriate use case for this, which I'm going to go through. But uh, in MongoDB, if you don't want to set up the, the external system, so certainly for, like, large performance reasons, going to Hadoop and using a real MapReduce system is, is preferable. Uh, but if you want to stick within MongoDB and certainly to learn MapReduce, uh, you can use the uh, JavaScript interface for that. Uh, and this is very convenient to use, although since it's in JavaScript, it's, the debugging facilities are not as um, straightforward as it would be if you were working with Hadoop. And you also have the ability to do, um, not just with Mongo's version of MapReduce, but most MapReduce support a incremental style so that if you were to run this, um, so you're constantly getting new data inserted to your database and you need to, to reduce it down to some aggregated state, uh, with incremental MapReduce, we could maybe process the last five minutes and, and run a little cron job every five minutes to iteratively process stuff. And based on the algorithm of how MapReduce works, this allows us we can have data already reduced and we can just reduce more data on top of it. Um, and so if we go back to like where MapReduce came from, it was basically, um, I think, one of the Google white papers on doing very, very large scale with commodity hardware uh, and doing large data processing. Uh, so this certainly works um, quite well. With Mongo 2.4, we have uh, V8 as a JavaScript interpreter. So running JavaScript in the server is no, nowhere near as bad as it was a year ago. Uh, so we can run multiple threads of JavaScript at the same time. Uh, and additionally, there's ways to avoid um, write locks if we do inline or just a few of these options to explore later if you take a look at the slides. Uh, if that's a concern, because typically MapReduce, your results will go to a collection, uh, and that's writing out to a database. So if you want to do things entirely in memory, uh, that's available to you. Uh, so the demo here that I want to go through is, uh, so MongoDB has this facility for profiling slow queries, the same way a lot of SQL databases have. And it basically dumps your uh, query objects and statistics about your query, like uh, lock times and how slow the queries ran. Uh, into this internal collection that we can in turn query and run our aggregations on. Uh, so at a hack day last year, um, I wrote a Silex application called Mongo QP for Query Profiler. And I later find out that one of our older employees had written something very much similar to this a few years prior, although it wasn't maintained. Uh, and the goal here was to take uh, queries, and if we think of a Mongo query, it's basically the same way that Mongo is storing and retrieving um, these JSON-like documents, uh, your queries are also expressed as, uh, as JSON uh, documents as well, where it's like field and value, or you might have operators for range queries and things like that. 
Uh, so basically, I wanted to examine all the queries that were in this profiler table. And by default, it's going to be any of the slower queries are the ones that get logged. Uh, and I wanted to take these queries and kind of extract the skeleton of the query. So if we think of like a SQL query, I want to extract the field names but not the values. So I can aggregate things based on the shape of the different queries that are being run. And that would tell us, well, what kind of indexes do we need? And what are these, these particular queries are running very slow, maybe because they're using regexes or, or, or whatnot. Uh, and then afterwards, once we've uh, grouped them to do just aggregations on the amount of time each query took um, and other statistics like that. So an example of what the profiler data looks like. Uh, so at the top, we have the operation. And this happens to be a query, but there's other, you might be running like commands might show up here. Uh, if you're doing inserts, uh, those also can get logged. Uh, additionally, the namespace would be the database and the collection name that we logged, um, that the query happened on. And I'm hiding the query blob here, but that's going to be some, some Mongo query that you executed. And additionally, the various statistics that we're going to look at. Uh, and the most interesting one is going to be, and the criteria for what we consider slow is going to be the milliseconds that it, the query took to run and the, the time that it was executed at. So I'm going to jump over to, that's a different demo. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to do it live and launch, oops. So this is a Silex app running on the local host and I'm going to go into the, uh, I'm not sure if there's anything in here yet. Nope. So there's currently not nothing in here yet. I'm going to turn on profiling. Uh, for this database, and uh, let's see the demo, and I'm just going to run a bunch of queries about a hundred times. And while that's running, I'm just going to go into here, and these are constantly running. Okay, so every time I display this, this page, I'm uh, essentially doing a MapReduce across the entire system profile collection. And the, the profiler is uh, what we call a capped collection, so it's, it's maybe going to hold the most recent 1,000 documents or 16 megabytes worth of documents, uh, and that's something that's configurable. Uh, unlike a typical collection where it could just grow as, as large as you possibly need it to. Uh, so I think this, yeah, just about, so we just did 100 of them. And so basically on the left here, we have these are exact queries that I was running. Uh, so with here, uh, I was looking, these are, my example data here is going to be the GitHub event data from githubarchive.org. Uh, so I'm basically querying for all the push events on JavaScript repositories. Um, and in here, these are just aggregating the values of the, the number of things that we scanned and the time. Uh, but the thing I want to focus on is how we were actually um, extracting the, the shell of the query. Maybe there's something more interesting on the a, on a next page here. Uh, so none of these actually have values getting <laughs> showed up here. Sorry about that. So basically our map step is going to be running through uh, each document in there, and we are kind of grouping it by these, um, by these values. And so for each document that we encounter, we end up emitting some, some value, and then there's some more JavaScript in there that's doing the actual processing. Uh, but the thing to take away here is this is something that we wouldn't be able to do with uh, typical, with like query operators, because we actually have to walk a JavaScript uh, object and, and aggregate on it. So I'm just going to go back here. And so these were just some of the queries that we were running, just querying by types uh, and payloads and things like that. Uh, so I don't want to linger on this too much, but uh, just an example of this, there's cases where MapReduce is completely the right option, and you have where you need more than, than just the normal querying at your disposal. Uh, but for something completely different, and it would be the bulk of the conversation today, is it's going to be about the aggregation framework. Uh, so whereas MapReduce and Mongo uses JavaScript, uh, the aggregation framework is expressed in the same way that we write queries. Uh, which means that it's, the execution is entirely server-side in C++, so there's no JavaScript interpretation happening. 
Uh, and if you were in Igor's, how many people were in Igor's talk a few minutes ago about HTTP interfaces? Why? Right. So the was like a perfect lead up to this because this is actually based on the Unix pipelines that he was uh, going off on for most of the presentation. Uh, so the concept to grasp here is gonna be uh, much simpler than wrapping your head around how MapReduce, uh, the MapReduce algorithm. So in here we have these pipeline of different operations where one operation will just feed in to the next, next operator in the pipeline. And in order to do things like addition, string concatenation, or work with dates and things, since we don't have a programming language at our disposal, uh, we have expressions available to us the same way we have query operators. Uh, and the thing I'm not gonna touch too much on today is that if you happen to be using sharded environments in Mongo, uh, it was necessary that this works with that. So. Uh, so the pipeline is gonna be processing a stream of documents, and so when we do an aggregation uh, invocation, we basically start it off with a collection. And so every document in that collection starts going into the pipeline, uh, just as if you were like catting a file in a directory. Uh, and then subsequent operators are just gonna either reduce that down or mangle the documents in some way. And your final output is going to be um, one or more documents which will be sent back as a single result of the command. Uh, and so the series of operators, the goal is either gonna be filtering or transforming and just passing it on to the next thing in the chain. And when we get to the end, uh, that's when the operation is complete. So the different operators at our disposal are uh, matching, which are gonna be uh, just simple, like a fine, the way you do a fine query and just match with some criteria. Uh, projections are typically, if you're doing fine queries, the, the second argument to that is saying like, which fields do I actually want to come back? Uh, additionally, projection is where we do a lot of the uh, beyond normal Mongo querying. Now projection is for doing actual, uh, like creating new fields or renaming fields. Um, and that's where we can use expressions as well. Uh, and group is gonna be the main aggregation um, functionality here. Uh, so grouping um, all of our documents into different buckets and then running certain expressions to maybe compute averages or sums along the way. Uh, we'll take a look at unwind. So one of the things I mentioned earlier was since it's a document database and we might have arrays of things or, or objects with nested fields, so unwind is gonna give us a way to uh, reach into arrays and iterate on the elements inside of a document. And then sort, limit, and skip probably need no explanation. And then, um, with, so aggregation framework came out in Mongo 2.2 last year, uh, and a few months ago we released uh, 2.4, and so we're adding more uh, geospatial uh, querying functionality to, to aggregation. So we already had it in normal querying before. Uh, so the example data for the, the slides to go through these are, we're just gonna use library books. Um, it's a bit contrived, but it has the basic um, schema features that, um, that you might encounter in your own documents here. So we have an array of tag subjects. Uh, we also have an embedded publisher object. We have some numeric fields and some string fields there as well. Uh, and in this case, I'm just gonna be using numeric IDs to keep things uh, simple, and typically it would be a larger, like a hashed object ID. Uh, so the match operator, um, very straightforward. It's just filtering documents that come through it. So this is very much similar to grep. And we're gonna be using the existing query syntax if you're familiar with writing normal Mongo queries. Um, and then more recently we have, if you have geospatial indexes, we can do uh, like matching documents that are where they're indexed uh, geo point or near a certain coordinate or something like that. Uh, and the thing that we don't have available to us is to execute JavaScript with the where operator, which you really shouldn't be doing anyway in your queries. Uh, so uh, just visual examples of going through this to just match field values. So if we see the three documents on the left there, let's say that's everything in the collection coming in. And then if we're matching it with uh, the Russian language, uh, that would be a language Russian as an object would just be the same query that we would normally give a Mongo find. And the result of this operator step is just gonna be that the War and Peace novel comes through. And the other documents just get ignored. Uh, and additionally, we can use the same query operators that we use to do things like range queries or uh, maybe matching dates or doing like a, a dollar in to compare multiple values or mixing and and or logic. Um, so any of the existing query operators here except for within, uh, for JavaScript execution would carry through. Um, project gets a little more interesting. So here we're, the documents coming in are gonna re reshape in some way. So whether that means ignoring certain fields within them. So with match, the documents that come in and documents that go out, it's just a matter of do I let this pass through or not. But with project, we're actually gonna change the document contents itself. 
Um, so at the most simple level, it's just including and excluding certain fields. Uh, but we can go beyond that and then create new fields or rename existing fields. And additionally, we have a syntax so that you can maybe reach into an embedded, like get the publisher city and, ex and move that to a top level field or vice versa. Take top level fields and create an embedded object with them. Uh, so I'm just gonna stand over here for this. Uh, so in this case, we're just using the zero and one syntax to say that we're excluding ID, including other two fields, uh, and everything else will be implicitly excluded. Uh, and then, uh, so in this case, probably no question about that, but where we're renaming and using computed fields, the syntax is going to be, um, in this case, this field does not exist, so we're not using a one or a zero here. Instead, we're giving it an object, which is gonna be some evaluated expression. Uh, so this is a preview at using uh, one of the mathematical expressions uh, to divide uh, two existing fields, and then referring to them by prefixing them with a dollar sign. So typically, your dollar sign is always gonna be used in Mongo for either special query operators, or in this being repurposed for uh, denoting a type of expression. Uh, and then when we use it as in place of a, a bit, uh, sorry, an argument, in this case, divide is an expression that takes uh, two arguments, so we just give them as an array of, of two strings. And if these were uh, not prefixed with a dollar sign, it would try and divide pages by chapters as strings, and that certainly wouldn't work. But we can divide, maybe pages divided by, and give it a literal number five. Um, so this is just the syntax for referring to fields by their, uh, by their value, uh, as if they were variables. Uh, and then in this case, we're just saying that the uh, lang field in our output should assume the value of whatever the language field in the input is. Uh, so that's just a straight rename. Uh, and so in the result here, we just end up with the average pages per chapter and uh, renamed language field. Uh, and then if we, since uh, plenty of people have either embedded documents or array fields in some capacity, if, they, if you need to work with those, again, quoting your, your strings and just using uh, the uh, dot symbol to reach in and pull things out, or at the to create embedded objects like we're doing with stats here, uh, where stats is an object, but now instead of using like dollar divide or dollar uh, and some other expression name, we're just giving it um, normal what would be normal field names. So this is just creating an embedded stats stats field for us. Uh, and so this is these three facets of project are gonna give us all the tools necessary to completely change the structure of the documents going through the pipeline. Uh, so I guess this could be like using awk or set uh, on the shell. And group is really where the magic happens. If you're not using group somewhere in your pipeline, you probably, uh, I would say, don't need to use the aggregation framework. Uh, but grouping is gonna allow us to group our documents by some, into buckets by some ID. Uh, certainly not necessarily the, un the underscore ID of the document, uh, but some, some value. Um, so if we were grouping books by their language or something like that. Uh, and the ID can be either a reference to a field, it could be an object if you wanna have, uh, include multiple values, uh, and it could also be a constant. If you want to group the entire collection and comp compute an average across the entire collection, you'll just group by some constant value, and that way every document gets lumped into the same bucket. And aside from the ID field, every other field has to be the result of some computed expression. Uh, because when the documents are getting lumped into buckets, they're basically losing their everything but their ID. Uh, and beyond their, the ID that tells us which bucket to put them in, we're basically deciding that um, we're gonna just aggregate the other values inside them that we care about. Uh, so max, min, average, and sum are gonna be the numeric operators. Um, which particularly what I used for the query profiler to find what was the average uh, query time for the, using the, the ID was the actual query structure itself, that object, and then I used max, min, and average to compute the uh, things to basically graph it out on that table. And if you do wanna collect the values that we come across, uh, we do have add to set and push, uh, which are just gonna collect values from each, as a document goes into the bucket, either uh, take the value and either add it to a set, so we're only collecting the unique ones that we see, or just push it into an array, in which case we might have duplicates. Um, so those two operators are gonna be the things if you actually wanna remember the values that you encountered. Uh, and then first and last is particularly useful if the data coming into our group uh, operator is sorted in some way, uh, which is gonna come up in the demo later, uh, to just pluck off the first value that we see or the last value. Uh, so if we think if we were doing like, um, 
maybe like stock, uh, stock trading data, things like that, where we had the open price and the closed price for a minute, and we're grouping by everything in a, in a current minute, we might want to capture the, um, yeah, the open and closed price for that uh, particular time series. Uh, and the other thing to consider is with group, um, the data is all being aggregated in memory. Uh, so the, um, a limit that I didn't uh, mention uh, earlier comes in a later slide, is that with uh, executing commands in Mongo, which aggregation framework is one, is limited to, so the, there's an implicit document limit, which is 16 megabytes for whatever comes back from the server. Uh, and when we're running commands, those are basically we're issuing a query over to Mongo and getting everything back as one single document. Uh, and MapReduce is a similar case, but it has the functionality where we can have all our results go out to a, uh, write them out to a separate collection, which is great for if we have more than 16 megabytes of, of results. So there's not a functionality uh, currently to, to dump our results out to, uh, out to a separate collection. We have to get everything back sent over to us on the wire. And that also comes into play with when we're processing things in memory with MapReduce, um, since it's made to be more distributed, there's the iterative uh, steps are able to um, like do the map steps and then dump that to a collection and then do the reductions and dump that to a collection in between. So all the pipeline operators are doing everything in memory. Um, so down the line, there's gonna be a functionality to put more than, if you have more than 16 megabytes of results, to dump that out into a, a collection. Um, but as far as everything running in memory, that's implicitly the, just the nature of how uh, this framework operates. And so that's really gonna come into play with, with group because we're collecting all these buckets in memory. With the other operators like project or match, basically they can do one document at a time and free the memory afterwards as they send it along to the next step. Uh, but group and we'll see sort is also special in that it has to collect everything before it passes anything along. Uh, so when we're calculating an average, um, an example of this with, with the dollar average expression. Uh, so I just have three abbreviated book documents there and just to group them by their language and then compute the average pages for them. And I'm using the same syntax I did with project uh, to refer to the pages field. And uh, that's gonna result with Russian. There was only one Russian book in the example. So it's exactly um, the original value. And then we computed the average of the two English books there. And for doing field summations, so we only had that sum operator. Um, so we can use that both to do counting and then um, do an actual summation of adding field values here. Uh, so by using sum with some constant value, it means every time I see a document, I'm adding one to it. Um, so inherently just doing a count there. And when I'm summing with the pages value, I'm adding a variable um, into the num pages property of the bucket as we go along. Uh, so that one operator can be used for, for both um, needs there. And then lastly is gonna be collecting distinct values. Uh, in this case, um, using add to set, because I, I don't want to have uh, duplicates, I think usually add to set is going to be more useful than, uh, than push, and it'll also lead, if you're seeing a lot of duplicates, it'll keep your arrays and your results a lot smaller. Uh, so it's just collecting unique titles that I see. And maybe this could be useful because um, maybe there were like two versions of War and Peace in the same language. Um, probably doesn't make as much sense in this contrived example as it would in, in real life. Uh, so unwind is going to be um, completely useful for working with any time you have to aggregate array fields. Uh, so going back to the original example where we had, uh, each book had an array of uh, tag strings, um, an array of strings which were, which were tags or subjects for them. So unwind, uh, to visualize this, um, uh, before we do the visualization, we're basically going to unwind on a particular field that's an array field. Um, and the goal here is that in the documents that come out of this unwind operator, the array gets replaced by each element uh, in the array. And there's just to cover the cases, if the field was missing, you wouldn't see any output, or if it was an empty array, there's nothing to unwind, so there's no output there. Um, and it would be an error to, do, to try and do this on like an integer field. Uh, so typically, you're gonna unwind and then maybe pipe those results over to a group so that we can group by array values. Uh, so as this example, just have uh, a book with three different subjects. So if we, un if we pass this, this one document going into the unwind operator, results in three documents coming out. Um, so it's much easier to visualize than it is explained in words. Should have just gone right to this. And sort, limit, and skip um, are gonna be very straightforward, um, whether it's like normal Mongo queries or um, exactly as they are in SQL. Uh, it's the same syntax for ordering things as we do with uh, when you do existing Mongo queries and work with cursors. 
And the uh, one caveat to consider is that when we're sorting something, um, so the operators like match and project, as they take input, they can immediately put out their output. Documents come in and they can immediately go forward. Uh, with sorting, we need to consider all the documents. We basically have to exhaust all of our input before we can let anything go beyond us. Uh, and the good example is there is maybe the thing that should be first in our um, emitted output actually comes to its last. So sort has to make sure that it considers absolutely everything before it passes it along. And again, that's gonna have memory implications. Is that it's gonna have to build everything up in memory. Uh, and I'll mention that there's, unless early and indexed uh, is a caveat there, because one of the optimizations is that if you were, uh, maybe do, if you're doing a combination of match, uh, sort, limit, and skip at the beginning of your pipeline, uh, we can, instead of sending the entire collection into your aggregation pipeline, we can just do a, an indexable query uh, upfront. So that's one of the transparent optimizations. Uh, and then limit and skip are gonna be exactly as they work with a cursor, um, and the visuals here are just gonna be really simple. Um, so a bunch of just books with just the title field. Let's say I just projected everything else out. So we're just focusing on the title here. And sorting by the title alphabetically will just reorder all my input into those documents coming out. Those in turn go into a limit operator. Um, so basically after the first five, we stop caring. And then beyond that, we skip past the first two. Um, and beyond that, uh, the GeoNear, which is uh, new, and I'm not gonna go to any examples of this because our books don't have any geospatial points in them. Uh, but this is um, only useful at the start of the pipeline because uh, it basically proxies to uh, the existing uh, Mongo command that does geospatial uh, queries. And it's just gonna return, it's gonna allow you to query your collection uh, by some, uh, by some point, in, by some, uh, yeah, geo point index and get all your documents back in the order of closeness or proximity to whatever point that you're querying by, and that's gonna start off your pipeline instead of a, a normal query or, the, or all the documents in the collection. And it's gonna see, if you've used the, the GeoNear uh, database command, it's gonna have the same options uh, with one addition there. Uh, so that's um, certainly covered more verbosely in the documentation. I'm not gonna uh, go into that. Uh, curious line wrapping here. Uh, so some of the expressions at our disposal, uh, we saw divide earlier and we saw some of the group expressions. So the whole point of these are, uh, they're expressed as objects, and typically an object with a dollar and then some uh, dollar sign and some, some name of the expression, and then either a single value or an array of multiple values if it takes multiple arguments. Uh, and so the goal here is these get evaluated over the course of the pipeline, and then they end up uh, basically getting resolved down to whatever they, uh, like whatever the quotient of division is, whatever the string that concatenates is maybe. Uh, and then, then you could certainly reference the existing fields the same way we did with project by using the same dollar and the field name syntax. Uh, so this is gonna be your alternative to if you're working in MapReduce and I have, I could do anything in JavaScript, but here there's, uh, there's maybe about 40 or 50 expressions at our disposal. Do things like date operations, uh, string manipulation, uh, logic uh, comparisons, conditionals. Uh, so there's plenty more of these and then this is certainly one of the areas that are constantly being added to with every, every version. Uh, so the thing that I personally find most interesting here is working with dates, um, particularly with grouping. So if we have uh, Mongo internally, the date object is just the Unix timestamp. And uh, previously for querying those, we basically had ranges at our disposal, but there was no way to really kind of extract a year out of a date uh, and group by that. Uh, so with expressions, we can use operators like year or day of month to pull out values, and this is gonna come into play in the, the demo at the end, uh, which gives us a lot more flexibility in working with dates instead of fetching everything, say, back to PHP and then doing it client-side. And so the usage for invoking this framework, uh, how many people with Mongo have run database commands in some form? Okay. Uh, so the main database command is just called aggregate. Uh, very straightforward there. And then like most of the uh, commands that developers would use, there's usually a, a helper function on the collection to do the same thing. So like MapReduce typically has a helper function. The find and modify command is another one. Uh, and so you could use either or, that's the same, um, exactly the same. In the PHP driver on the Mongo collection object, we have an aggregate method, uh, which is just more shorthand instead of running the command uh, on the database. Uh, and so it looks like when we run with the collection method, we're basically giving it an array of objects, and each object is gonna be a pipeline operator uh, that we covered earlier. 
Uh, so in this case, I'm going to take all the books in the collection and just sort them by when they were created. Uh, I'm going to unwind them so I can examine all the subjects individually. Um, and at that point, they're still sorted by their uh, creation date. And then at this point, I'm going to group them down by subject, uh, count them. So that's what n sum is doing. And then in the next, in the FC, I'm capturing the first time that they were created, uh, the first uh, timestamp. And then after this, I, I'm going to keep the subject, which was my bucket ID. I'm going to keep the n value. And with FC, I basically just care about the year. I don't care about the full date. And so the results there are just going to be every subject, um, the number of books in that subject, and the first year that somebody wrote a book, and we happen to add it to our database. So any questions about that, those three, three uh, guys working in unison there? Uh, and exactly the same way with the database command, slightly more verbose because we run, the commands get run on the database. Uh, so when we specify aggregate, we have to give it the collection name that we run on. Uh, but beyond that, the pipeline argument here is exactly what the argument was to the helper method. And this is um, same semantics if you're using the PHP driver. And the th thing this really visualizes what I said earlier about that, that document limit. Uh, so when we run commands, we get this single document back. So it's really internally is doing a fine query on some internal collection name. Uh, so it's the same API as you would normally query for your collections is to run commands. Uh, so in this case, all of our results, and these are technically our documents at this point, uh, but those are going to come back to us in a result array, uh, sorry, in a result field. And then this command doesn't really have any other information, uh, like MapReduce returns some extra statistics. Uh, in aggregation frameworks case, you basically get OK, 1, or 0. If it failed in 0, you won't find results anyway. Uh, but basically, when you run commands, you want to check that the OK value is 1 before you work with the result. Uh, and the other thing to consider, I guess, here is that um, when our documents are coming into our database, uh, well, sorry, when they're coming into the aggregation pipeline, they're documents from our collection, and they are documents that are actually stored on disk. But once they go through a group or a project or something that mangles the shape of them, the documents from that point on are, you could think of them as purely synthetic. So they might not look like anything that's actually stored on disk. Uh, in that case, they're just things that we're modifying in memory. Uh, so I'm hesitant to call these actual documents because they might have uh, they could have duplicate IDs and things like that. Uh, so the limitations, which I probably drove home three times now already, uh, the document size is limited to 16 megabytes, and in the future there's going to be um, an operator to dump out your output to a collection, uh, but currently not. And this is probably more relevant if you're, certainly for the final command result, but also if you're working with sharding, the individual uh, shard servers have to send their, they can run part of the aggregation pipeline, and then we have the Mongo S, which is the proxy process, do the rest of the pipeline. Uh, so that'll come up later, but the 16 megabyte limit there is, um, is present there as well. Um, and I think hopefully this, by 2.6 at the end of this year, I think uh, we'll have a workaround for this. Uh, and additionally, the thing to be concerned with is just the memory limits of the pipeline operators. So just group and sort, uh, depending how much data you're processing. Uh, and that's something certainly in your control by maybe do more aggressive matching up front in the way that you order your pipeline operators. Uh, so the framework tries to be smart and uh, like implicitly optimize things for you, uh, but there's still cases where um, just by manually doing more aggressive matching or limits up front instead of later uh, will help you. Uh, so the second demo, um, also a Silex application, is on time series visualization. And the example data that we're using is exchange rates for euro and British pounds. Um, the charting uh, that we're going to do here, um, so just this is also going to be running in, in real time. We have about, uh, I guess, 20,000 documents to, uh, that are going to get aggregated. And we're going to be plotting, how many people are familiar with candlestick charts for financial graphs? Okay, so once it's on the screen, I'll be able to uh, explain it. I'm not going to even try to do this in words. Uh, but basically, the things that we care about are, for a given minute, what was the average exchange rate, uh, what was the open and close price, and what were the peaks that we hit over the course of the minute. Uh, so since we're aggregating an entire minute and we have data per second or multiple times per second, uh, there's going to be a lot of fluctuations, and we're just going to collapse that down into a single box graph, a single candlestick. Uh, so the example data, and here we're just going to be working with either the ask or the bid price. Uh, I forget which you're using the code. Uh, but the, basically, each one has an ID. Every document needs an ID. Uh, we basically just have the exchange rate and the current time. Let's 
So I'm once again going to do it live, and I have to source my. And I will. Okay. So in this case, um, we have the example data there, uh, which we saw, and there's just a whole mess of those documents for uh, a few hours worth of time. And this is the result of our aggregation framework here is we're getting, I'm going to take a look at the AJAX requests in a bit. Uh, I wish this was using WebSockets, that'd be more entertaining. Uh, but each of these, let me just pause it. Uh, so each of these uh, candlesticks, the actual filled-in area is representing uh, either the open or the closed price. And if it's red, it basically means that we closed lower, uh, so it's bad. <laughs> and if it's uh, blue, that means we're going up. Uh, and then the latter points that extend beyond are the min and the max over that whole time period. Uh, and additionally, we're plotting the average with the little, little green guy in the middle. Uh, so just to take a look at what the what the aggregation code for this looks like. And I'm just going to jump back to the, what the example data look like as well. Uh, so again, we just have these three fields, um, uh, ID, the rate, and the timestamp. And we're going to start off by projecting, and I'm going to use the date operators to kind of so we have these dates, and I care about everything except the second. So I'm going to create this embedded object uh, with five different fields. Um, and unlike, I have to do this object casting because PHP is a little uh, silly when it comes to numerics. I'm basically going to pluck out the year, month, the day of the month, the hour, and the minute. And this is going to give me just everything but the second. And I'm going to store this in a field called minute. And then I'm also going to save the timestamp and the bid price. And then after this, I want to sort everything by the timestamp uh, because I'm going to be going in to do these candlesticks graphs, so it's important that I have the first and the last value I encounter be the open and close price for that minute. Uh, and then beyond this, the next step is going to be the grouping, and I'm going to be grouping by the minute object, uh, which is completely, uh, you're certainly allowed to do that. You don't just have to group by a, a scalar value. Uh, and so this is going to give, load everything into buckets per uh, down to minute resolution. And for the timestamp, I'm just going to, I need something to render at the top of the page, so I'm just going to, the timestamp is, I'm just going to render the minute anyway, so I'm just going to capture the first value there. Um, it would have been a waste of memory to use something like add to set. Uh, and then for the open, close, high, and low prices, uh, so the open and close are going to be the first and last value I've seen, and that's because the data is sorted. Uh, and then the high and low values, I'm just going to track the max and the min, and then the average is also, I think that's self-explanatory. So at this point, I'm going to have buckets for each of those I'm going to have a whole bucket of documents for the candlesticks. And the result of my group documents are um, uh, basically these five fields are going to be everything necessary to render a candlestick. Uh, afterwards, the sort is probably superfluous here. But the uh, skipping, I'm basically doing, and, and this is also very inefficient, but it's, uh, it, the performance uh, still keeps up with it. Uh, I'm skipping ahead in the results, so I'm basically aggregating the entire collection of, of 20,000 documents. Uh, I really could be a lot better at this and just match down to the particular range that I care about, uh, and that would certainly be the, uh, if I went back and refactored this, that would be the certainly better thing to do here. But I'm just doing poor man's uh, pagination here with a skip and a limit, and then at the very end, I'm just using another projection to rename some of the fields. And so this basically comes back um, to the application, and I'll just take a look at the that is the wrong, it's the third window. Take a look at the, is it under network, I guess? Okay. And I'll just open up one of these. So I'm basically getting back a small snippet of aggregation results back as JSON every second. And then that's, uh, happens to be six, so it just renders the entire, entire thing in JavaScript. Uh, and so the, the main benefit here is with, in both cases, in the, in the MongoQP, the app, the refactoring for that is for me to move to incremental MapReduce. And that's going to allow me to, uh, I guess for a larger scale web application, make more efficient use of it. It's, it's not reasonable to run MapReduce uh, on demand, basically, on a query. 
Uh, but in something like the aggregation framework, the performance is there since there's no JavaScript interpreting, uh, where it's copes just fine running large-scale uh, aggregation queries. Uh, in either case, I just suggest if, uh, basically start with aggregation framework, see if you uh, reach a limit, and if there's functionality that isn't there, then that's considering one of the other processes, but I think it's a good, it's now a good, a good starting point. And the last thing, um, is anyone actually doing sharded data with Mongo? That's unlikely. Uh, so just an example with, uh, this doesn't render too nicely, uh, but basically with, uh, when we're doing sharding, and it's just like with uh, SQL sharding, our data is partitioned in different places. Uh, so to do an aggregation query across the entire uh, sharded collection, uh, we could basically do it up to a point, uh, but then when we reach the first group or sort, we have to consider everyone's results. Uh, so that's a point where, in this example, if you just ignore shard three because the uh, display resolution is a little too narrow. Uh, but if we, up front, we happen to do a match as the first uh, part of our aggregation framework, and so we knew off the bat that nothing that we cared about was on shard three. Uh, so there is not a, let me see if I can actually make this smaller. Okay, that's a little better. Uh, so shard three doesn't have to do anything because we matched up front. Uh, and then for the group, group step, group is a point where we're gonna have to consider results from everyone, but the individual partitions can do some of the grouping themselves. And then the Mongo S is that, is a proxy process basically that you, your driver would connect to that before you talk to all the partitions. Uh, so you, your driver just thinks it's talking to one server. It doesn't, it abstracts away the, the partitions. Uh, but the, the rest of the, the framework basically splits up the pipeline in uh, two points. Uh, whether it's a group or a sort. And at some point, when we need to consider results from everybody, the Mongo S process will kick in and run the rest of the pipeline for us. Okay. Uh, so the other just things looking ahead, uh, so the basic use cases for this, um, if you have these needs and you happen to be using Mongo already, or you're considering it, um, I would look into using aggregation framework for these things. Uh, any basic queries, grouping and um, uh, averaging, um, counts, there's no need to do it just for basic counting. Uh, but if you're doing anything like ad hoc reporting, like an admin interface, um, especially if it's not like public user facing where it's gonna get slammed by a prime time TV commercial, uh, perfectly good for that. Uh, any real time analytics because the, the performance of running these, C++, these pipelines in C++ instead of interpreted JavaScript with MapReduce uh, is there as well. Uh, and I think the performance should also be higher than doing like proper MapReduce in a, in a separate external system, because that's typically not done on demand. Uh, and then the facilities, I think it's ideally suited uh, for doing things like time series data. I mean, the group, the group expressions that are currently available are basically exactly what's necessary to, to do that kind of graphing. Uh, and some future enhancements, uh, the out operator, um, these are actually linked to JIRA tickets. Uh, unfortunately, they were bumped from 2.4. But I think the out operator should be showing up in uh, 2.6, unless it gets moved again. Uh, and then there's a lot of tickets just around optimization and taking uh, pipelines that the user specifies and internally knowing that maybe Mongo server can reorder them and still get the same result, but run it more efficiently. Uh, and additionally, the other thing that um, we'd really like to have is like an explain facility, the same way we can uh, explain our queries or get more details on how MapReduce operations run. Uh, that's something that certainly would be beneficial for, the, for this framework. And some other memory improvements around doing groups and things, because that's one of the other limiting factors aside from the, uh, from the out operator being required. Those are really the two choke points right now. Uh, and so the yeah, takeaway here is uh, this is, uh, so another new feature that Mongo added recently was text search. And by no means is this something to compete with Solar or Elasticsearch. Uh, and I would say the same thing that the aggregation framework by no means is competing with uh, MapReduce or um, large scale like data warehousing needs. Uh, but it's a tool there and if you uh, don't want to bother setting up some external tool, if this handles 90% of the use cases, that's probably the end goal. I just give, give more options for people that already have data in Mongo. Uh, and then if you are currently, we're currently using MapReduce queries and are tired of <laughs> maintaining JavaScript, if that's something that you could port over to aggregation pipelines, and then now you're just, instead of maintaining separate JavaScript code, you just have these uh, more readable pipeline uh, objects. I think that's, it's better for code maintainability. Uh, so thank you, I'll take any questions, but I think we're uh, probably also near the end for, uh, Jeopardy is coming up in about 15 minutes.
stick around for any questions after, but thanks for your time. And the slides later will have links to the